Thank you. And uh, I'd like to begin by simply thanking the organizers for this invitation. It's been a, a great seminar series so far, and I really look forward to hearing the speakers uh, yet to come. Uh, before I begin, I just uh, need to disclose my um, uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, I am a founder, shareholder, and consultant in, in Arvinus, as well as Hall of Therapeutics. What I'd like to do today um, is is begin where I think many uh, of the speakers have begun, and, and that is uh, this challenge that is facing the pharmaceutical industry. And that is, ever since the, the finishing of the human genome, we know every single possible drug target, uh, but we don't know necessarily uh, which proteins should be focused on, and more importantly, how to make these undrugged proteins pharmaceutically vulnerable. And so I think we would all agree uh, that a new paradigm is, is needed, something that is um, different than the current paradigm uh, that's focused on occupancy. And, and by that, I mean uh, inhibitors, small molecule inhibitors that bind to active sites. And by binding these active sites, give the clinical benefit um, that, and that is desired. But there's a major drawback in occupancy-driven pharmacology, and that is most uh, drugs are reversible. They will fall off, meaning that you need to have excess drug available to take that place. Um, and that's a challenge today. How do you achieve and maintain high systemic levels of uh, a particular drug in, in a patient? And moreover, the, the problem protein persists as well. And so what we're all trying to do is develop a new paradigm based on targeted protein degradation. Uh, the idea, of course, is that we can co-opt the cellular machinery that's responsible uh, for protein turnover and to now eliminate these proteins uh, in a catalytic mechanism. It would be nice to be able to make the first all small molecule catalytic drug that's capable of seeking and destroying these rogue disease-causing proteins. And so this is an idea that I've been working on for now 20 years. Uh, Ray gave a great talk a couple of weeks ago, uh, mentioning briefly the, the, a bit of the history. Yes, it, it, it was a, a very productive um, poster session over some beers uh, at the Burroughs Welcome New Investigator uh, Retreat um, in 1999. This, this post, <laughs> this picture is actually uh, from last year, 20 years later. And, uh, but it was a very productive uh, discussion that led to the, the first uh, PROTAC paper uh, in, in 2001, and a series of papers after that as well. Um, the idea, as, as we know, is, is a relatively simple one. This is a hetero bifunctional uh, play where one end of this uh, bifunctional molecule binds to the protein of interest that we want to eliminate. The other end binds to an E3 ligase that's responsible for uh, adding a ubiquitin. And so it's this induced proximity uh, whereby uh, this uh, protac serves as a bridge between the target protein and the E3 ligase. And simply by inducing proximity, we can get the transfer of ubiquitin from the E3 ligase onto the target, leading to its ultimate uh, destruction by the 26S proteasome. And importantly, the protac survives this to undergo multiple rounds uh, uh, of recruitment and therefore acts in a substoichiometric uh, catalytic mechanism, which is a, it was a real advance over the current paradigm. And so over the years, um, we've been working on this uh, initially as a chemical biology project uh, in collaboration with Ray. Uh, we used a short peptide uh, that bound to an E3 ligase, uh, VHL von hippel lindau And that served uh, as a, a nice chemical biology uh, probe molecule. We, we used a cell penetrating peptide to get this large bulky uh, chimeric molecule inside cells. But we were able to couple onto this peptide a variety of ligands, uh, androgen derivatives, estrogen derivatives, able to degrade AR and ER. Uh, we were able to even make these things membrane permeable uh, more, more directly. Um, but over the years, uh, we felt that we had published sufficiently to demonstrate the proof of concept as, as a chemical biology proof of concept. And Ray's lab uh, started focusing on other things. 
Um, and I started thinking about what else we could do with this. Uh, I, I didn't feel like we could just continue to, to publish peptide-based uh, protax over and over again. Um, and so I made the decision to come up with a small molecule replacement for the peptide. And as you can see, there, there are a number of years here in which we didn't have publications. But it's this, this uh, small molecule ligand for VHL that really has catalyzed uh, a new phase of uh, the targeted protein degradation field. And the idea is that we now have a small molecule that binds to VHL to the same site as the peptide that we were using before. But this small molecule has better pharmaceutical properties uh, and, and therefore is, is more drug-like. And by we, of course, it wasn't I, it was a, a team of, of researchers uh, led on the chemistry side by a very talented graduate student in my lab, Dennis Buckley, uh, who carried his interest in Protax to uh, uh, the Farber, uh, working with Jay, and Alessio Trulli, a visiting postdoc in my lab, uh, who has now set up a shop at the University of Dundee and is doing some really exciting things uh, at the forefront of uh, Protax development. But this small molecule uh, allowed me to be able to convince uh, traditional drug developers that this was a, a concept that had potential beyond just simply a chemical biology curiosity. They could see a path forward. Yes, it is a large molecule. Yes, it had potential problems, but they could see a path forward to developing a, a drug candidate. And so in 2013, I, I founded uh, Arvenis. In, uh, in New Haven, uh, and they're doing some really wonderful things, having taken this technology to a completely another level. Um, but this small molecule VHL ligand uh, allowed us also to start thinking about exploring the technology more robustly. And the first project was one that Dennis uh, spearheaded, and it was this uh, idea of coming up with a small molecule uh, degrader of halotag fusion proteins. Halotag protein is a bacterial dehalogenase that is mutated such that uh, chloroalkanes serve as pseudo substrates and therefore covalently bind. And so we generated a cell line that expressed GFP halotag and made a series of protax, uh, haloprotax, uh, um, that had VHL recruiting elements to them with the idea is that by bridging VHL and this fusion protein, we could take cells that normally are uh, fluorescent green, but because we can induce the degradation of this fusion protein, they now no longer fluoresce. And we're able to uh, demonstrate very potent uh, activities with it for these halo protax, uh, a, a DC50 value in the nanomolar range, a, a maximum uh, degradation or Dmax, uh, uh, that is uh, approaching 95%. Um, and these are terms that we had previously used, um, Dmax, as well as DC50 values. But this study, this Halo Protax study, also uh, allowed us to start thinking about uh, other uh, characteristics, other concepts. Uh, and the first up was uh, the hook effect. Um, it was very clear that certain protax, halo protax, uh, had a, a, a wicked hook. Uh, and if, by that, I mean that at higher concentrations, uh, they could no longer form productive ternary complexes uh, and that the binary complexes were favored. Thus, uh, we had decreased ubiquitination and decreased, um, decreased degradation. Um, other other uh, concepts that sort of have sprung from uh, some of the works in, in my lab is this, this terminology, uh, terminology, this term linkerology, uh, which I use as, as a joke, um, but it's really funny to, to hear other labs uh, talk about linkerology. But, but by linkerology, I mean is that when one optimizes um, a protac, uh, one has to consider a variety of things. You know, linker length is, is critical. The composition of the linkers is critical. The rigidity of the linker is critical. All of these come into play to be able to optimize uh, the degradation kinetics. And as you'll see, also uh, can improve substrate uh, selectivity as well. And so 
we were able to uh, demonstrate this uh, quite nicely with a protact that we developed to a receptor tyrosine kinase. This is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's quite selective. It, it, it is an inhibitor for the uh, epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR, as well as the related uh, RTK HER2. And so we took lapatinib and we converted it to a VHL-based uh, protac, as well as a variant that where we inverted uh, a stereocenter uh, that would now cripple the ability for this protac to engage uh, to engage uh, VHL, but yet it still has inhibitory activity. And so when we added these to cells, uh, we were pleasantly uh, surprised to see that we could degrade e EGFR, and, and not surprisingly, we, uh, the epimer did not degrade uh, wild-type EGFR. And so all of this was sort of to be expected, uh, and like I said, this bound to or inhibits EGFR. Um, it also inhibits HER2, as I mentioned before, and it degrades HER2. I should say the two-peg version of this protac degrades both of these. Uh, what we found um, what, that was quite surprising is that if we increase the length of this uh, linker by one peg unit to three pegs, we could retain the ability to inhibit EGFR, but we lost the ability to degrade HER2. And so simply by changing linker length, we were able to gain uh, selectivity. Similarly, uh, our Venice uh, saw something uh, as well in along these lines when they were developing a, a, a protac against a serine threonine kinase called TBK1. This is a member of the IKK family of kinases. Uh, and in addition to um, um, playing a role in immune responses, uh, it also plays a role in tumor genesis and, and as well as development. And so the story goes that a off-the-shelf literature compound uh, was used as a recruiting element. This is a, a single-digit nanomolar inhibitor of TBK. And we coupled it to a variety of different uh, linkers uh, to be able to make a, a short, small library of, of protax. And as you can see, Short linkers uh, initially uh, were too short in the sense that they could not bridge the, the two proteins and it showed no degradation. But once clearing a, a threshold, uh, we got very potent uh, degradation. Uh, in fact, nanomolar degraders were discovered in the first 30 protax. But the, the story that I wanna emphasize here has to do with some specificity. There is a, another, uh, and uh, another family member uh, that is inhibited by this particular kinase uh, inhibitor, uh, IKK epsilon. These are the inhibitory uh, constants for the inhibitor for the two different uh, kinases. If we turn this now into a protac, we lose some of the inhibitory activity, uh, but it still is a potent nanomolar. These protacs are, are potent nanomolar inhibitors. Uh, of these um, of these kinases, and so it was surprising that when we added it to cells, since we had optimized for TBK1 degradation, we weren't surprised that we were able to see very potent TB1 TBK1 uh, degradation. But we were surprised not to see IKK epsilon, given the fact that it still was able to bind in a binary way uh, to, to this uh, particular family member. And so that really uh, speaks uh, volumes to the ability to use linker length and, and as well as other aspects of linkerology to dial in favorable uh, characteristics into uh, protact design. Next concept that I want to mention is, is this concept of differential biology. Uh, and by that, I mean, what does one gain by degrading a target versus simply inhibiting it? And this is a project that uh, was one in which we developed a new class of uh, protex, uh, in this case, targeting a different E3 ligase, Cerebron. And the target is one that uh, is, is very familiar to the folks at, at, at the Farber, uh, and it's BRD4, which is a member of, of a BET domain 
protein of uh, chromatin leaders. And is a very attractive drug target because it is upstream of uh, the oncogene NIC, which it itself is difficult to drug. But there's been a lot of interest in coming up with inhibitors. Uh, the one that uh, my lab has used is the OTX015. Uh, it's a very potent in inhibitor, but it has a problem in the sense that um, inhibition of uh, BRD4 function is sensed by cells and cells have a evolutionarily conserved mechanism to now compensate for that loss of function. It makes more of the target protein. Uh, and this is true across uh, all the family members. Uh, this is just a reflection of how important BRD4 function is to, to life. And the problem is that uh, under the occupancy driven paradigm of inhibitors, uh, what is a normal level of BRD4 uh, increases dramatically as you now add more inhibitor. And the more inhibitor by inducing more protein requires more, pro more, more inhibitor to now saturate those. So it's a bit of a pharmacological arms race, uh, which is difficult to win because the cell will always be able to make more uh, of the protein, but yet you, uh, a clinician may not be able to dose uh, infinitely uh, to, to get that maximum saturation. And so the idea is, could we take OTX015 and convert it into, a, in this case, a cerebron-based protec. Uh, and this is the molecule that we generated. It's a very potent degrader of uh, BRD4, again, a, a picomolar degrader and, and nice maximum uh, degradation. Uh, this is just simply that, that, uh, those data again in terms of uh, the pre-existing levels of BRD4 are greatly amplified uh, upon inhibition. But if we turn OTX015 into a protac, now we can degrade whatever is pre-existing, excuse me, pre-existing here, but also we can degrade whatever the cell is trying to make. And, and we know that uh, the RNA levels uh, are, are comparably upregulated uh, with protac and, and inhibitor, but yet the, the protein levels uh, we're able to degrade faster than it can be synthesized or accumulate. And that leads to a more profound effect on downstream MYC. And now we can start to see cell death. And so this is an example of, of differential biology where you, you have the same element that's engaging the target protein, but depending on whether there's just a hydrogen here or whether there is this linker and a recruiting element, you can get two different cell fates. Uh, one is simply uh, compensatory mechanisms to maintain survival, uh, or uh, the degrader can actually induce cell death because it can short circuit um, that mechanism. And so the best protac targets are, are those that, that offer a differential uh, biology upon degradation. This next concept uh, sort of stemmed from a series of questions uh, that I was continuing getting after presenting our work at, at conferences. Um, people are very curious about um, ProTac design and, and one of the most uh, commonly asked questions were, well, how specific does the recruiting element have to be? How, how what's the potency, what's the selectivity needed to, to make a, a degrader? And so, we, we wanted to uh, address this uh, by using a highly promiscuous uh, degrader. Um, and, and so, excuse me, a highly promiscuous uh, uh, recruiting element. Um, this is a ferretinib. It binds to uh, over 130 kinases um, and is, uh, um, it's crystal structure solved, so we know exactly where we might be able to modify it to convert it into a, a protac. And so we added a linker, we added uh, our VHL ligand, as well as we added a linker and the cerebron. So we made two different uh, uh, tool compounds, uh, protacs, uh, all based on the ferretinib warhead, but recruiting different E3 ligases. And, and we wanted to ask the question that if Ferretinib, the warhead binds 130 plus uh, kinases. 
if we were to make a, a, a series of protacts, would they also bind? Do we, do we change the binding selectivity specificity simply by making a uh, protact? And then of course, the ultimate question are, are these protacts able to degrade um, 133 uh, kinases? And if not, what subsets of, of that total are susceptible to uh, degradation? And so to answer the first question about binding, uh, looking at a kinome scan in gray of ferretinib, each bar here represents a kinase that is inhibited by this promiscuous inhibitor. Uh, when we added the linker and the uh, VHL ligand to make this VHL protac, uh, we were surprised to see that while some of these kinases uh, were still inhibited by the, this particular protac, we lost some uh, inhibitory activity against other kinases. And this was true for both the VHL as well as the cerebron-based protac. Some kinases still were inhibited, but other kinases down here, as you can see, uh, were no longer susceptible to these, uh, this um, ferretinib-based uh, cerebron uh, protac. Interestingly, there wasn't an uh, exact overlap. Uh, and I was a bit surprised by that, given the fact that it's the same recruiting element, it's the same attachment point, it's the same linker. It just depends on whether you have VHL or, or an image-based uh, recruiting element on the other end. Now, looking at the ability for these protacts to degrade the kinases, um, looking at VHL and, and the cerebron based what we saw was the vast majority of these kinases were not degraded. So even though uh, they were reported to be binding to uh, the warhead, ferretinib, when we turned ferretinib into a protac, we lost the ability to degrade. Uh, now, we also saw something that was quite striking, that some of these kinases were degraded, but they were only degraded by the VHL, or conversely, only degraded by the cerebron based, um, based uh, uh, protac. So this got us uh, very interested uh, in, in some of the mechanisms behind this, but it was clear that, that it's possible to take something, a warhead that binds multiple proteins and convert it into a, a, a selective degrader. Now, to this question about uh, uh, mechanism, it led us into this concept of cooperativity. And, and the first question that we, we wanted to ask was, is there a correlation between the binary affinity uh, of a protact to its target protein and uh, subsequent degradation? And so we replotted the data from the previous experiment, just focusing on, on VHL for, for this case. Uh, VHL uh, binding affinity versus the ability to degrade a, a particular kinase. And as you can see, down here, you, you have high affinity binding and you have great degradation. Uh, and, and CMET is a, a wonderful example uh, of a kinase that, that uh, is degraded and is bound in a binary way to uh, the fretinib, for, um, fretinib uh, warhead. But there are other examples. SLK is one that binds with similar binary interaction, but is not being degraded. And there are examples where you have uh, a molecule, uh, excuse me, a protein that binds poorly, but yet is still degraded very, very well. And P38 is, is one that um, really had us scratching our head in the sense that it binds with a binary interaction of, of 11 micromolar, but yet what had a DC50 value of uh, 200 nanomolar and near quantitative degradation. And so uh, to, to explore whether uh, there could be something at the ternary complex if it's not a binary interaction that's driving degradation. Uh, we did some pull down assays. We mobilized uh, the E3 ligase, added our protac, and just simply went fishing uh, from a whole cell lysate that expresses a lot of different kinases and just asked which kinases were actually uh, pulled down. And as you can see, CMET here uh, is pulled down. It does have a binary interaction. And as I said before, it is uh, very well degraded. SLK has similar uh, binary interaction. It is not degraded, 
uh, but that is reflected in its inability to form no ternary complex. And then conversely, P38, despite its weak uh, binary interaction, can form a ternary complex. And we believe that is what is driving uh, the, the degradation of P38. And so it's the stabilizing PPIs uh, can compensate for the weak binary uh, affinity between the, the ferretinib and, and the target protein. Now, we we're able to explore this a little bit more uh, initially with some modeling and then some experimental follow-up. Uh, this is a model of, of P38 uh, structure and, and VHL uh, complexed with uh, a, a fretinib-based protac. And from this model, uh, we, we saw a protein-protein interface, um, and we were able to hypothesize that a close contact at this PPI, this is a alanine on the P38 side, and this is an arginine on, on, on the VHL side, we thought that this is, since this is in such close contact, could we actually um, test this, this hypothesis um, by actually introducing steric bulk at this position? Just to remind you again, a pull down assay, this is wild type P38 can be pulled down in that, uh, uh, in that assay, forming a ternary complex. If however, we, we add uh, instead of a lysine here, add a, a lysine residue, that lysine mutant no longer can form a ternary complex. It cannot be pulled down. Whereas a more conservative alanine to valine can be pulled down. And so we feel that, that this is a, uh, at, at a molecular level, uh, uh, we have a fairly good idea of, of what's happening at this interface. And this is uh, translated also into degradation. This is wild type. Uh, P38 is, is degraded by the protac. But again, if we make that point mutation, uh, introducing steric bulk to, to disrupt uh, the PPI, if we introduce that steric clash, we no longer have protac mediated degradation. And so we feel that that uh, PPI formation is, is, is a really important consideration when designing uh, potent protex. The next project uh, was a, a wonderful project led by a very talented Yale undergraduate who's now doing his MD PhD at Harvard, uh, Blake Smith. And, and the, it sort of came about um, a, from our hypothesis about target presentation. And, and could we differentially present uh, a, a target to an E3 ligase and, and what effect would that have on, on specificity? And, and this was uh, an easy question to address because we had a VHL ligand and we had already made protax uh, coming off of this in two different uh, linker points. Uh, we call this the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Right-hand side was the site of attachment for uh, the halo protax, and many of the other VHL-based protax are coming off the left-hand side. So we knew that both sides uh, were, it was possible to recruit proteins. Um, but we wanted to see, given a particular protein, whether it made a difference on how that uh, target was presented to an E3 ligase. So using these, and again, coming back to ferretinib, I have already described uh, the P38 degrader uh, ferretinib-based, VHL-based protec uh, off of the left-hand side. And so we just simply, again, using ferretinib, uh, we now made a, uh, an attachment off of the right-hand side and asked, does P38 still degrade? And so again, this is P38 alpha, it degrades when uh, fretinib is coming off of the right, the left-hand side, um, but it is not degraded when it's coming off the left, uh, the right-hand side. Did I say that right? Left-hand side, right-hand side. Interestingly, when we started to look at some of the other kinases that were degraded, uh, P38 delta, a related family member, uh, was not degraded coming off of uh, the left-hand side but was degraded coming off the right-hand side. And so this was really nice in the sense that depending on how one presented the, the recruiting element, one could get 
uh, isoform selective uh, degradation. And, and we could follow this up a little bit in terms of mechanism by looking at pull downs, again, immobilizing VHL, and we could pull down P38 alpha uh, using the PROTAC uh, that was selective for degrading alpha, um, but we could not pull down the one that was selective for delta. And likewise, just an uh, orthogonal assay, this is an ELISA screen, excuse me, alpha screen, alpha ELISA screen, uh, one could see nice selective uh, ternary complex. In fact, we actually see a little bit of a hook here uh, and illustrating that there is selective ternary complex depending on how we did, uh, how we added things. Uh, it's a great paper. I, I came out um, uh, in Nature Communications and, and if you're interested, I, I encourage you to uh, follow up um, with that. The next uh, concept was one that uh, sort of, it comes back to the original idea of occupancy um, and, and some of the limitations of occupancy driven uh, paradigm. And it really is a, uh, it, it discusses the um, a state of the art uh, drug for prostate cancer. Enzalutamide is an anti-androgen. It, it binds to the androgen receptor and blocks the function uh, of AR. Um, and uh, we've been able to convert that uh, into a protac by adding a VHL ligand to it, uh, getting a nice degradation uh, of AR. Uh, near maximum um, uh, degradation. It's a potent antiproliferative. You look at blue here, this is the warhead in zalutamide, uh, which has uh, its own potency. But if you now convert in zalutamide into a protac, we can now make uh, this molecule even more potent uh, in terms of blocking cell proliferation. Um, but I don't like comparing the warhead with the protac, given the differences in the physical chemical properties. Protex are, are, are large molecules. They, in my case, uh, they haven't been optimized uh, by uh, medicinal chemists for, for uh, the hundreds and thousands of hours uh, necessary to, to get a lead compound. Um, better comparison is the enzalutamide based protex in red with its inactive epimer here, which still has enzalutamide. So this in green, uh, this inhibition is due to the inhibitory aspects of that inactive epimer. Uh, but the delta between red and green is the advantage one gets when one degrades versus inhibits. Now, um, what I wanted to emphasize uh, and why I chose this as an example um, is that uh, there is a, uh, a unique mechanism of resistance uh, seen in the clinic. Uh, oftentimes with enzalutamide uh, treated patients. And in some patients, uh, it's been found that the tumors themselves can produce testosterone, which is kind of a, a, a crazy idea, uh, but it is, uh, just illustrates how wily uh, uh, tumors can be in terms of developing uh, resistance mechanisms. Um, but here you have a tumor that produces its own competitor for the active site uh, of, of the drug. So uh, what was initially a 98-99% a occupancy with enzalutamide, now that the tumor is making testosterone, uh, that occupancy rate now drops down to 70, 60, 40, and enzalutamide uh, loses its clinical benefit because of, of this competition. We can recapitulate this loss of activity uh, using a synthetic androgen and just dose higher and higher concentrations of the synthetic androgen and just ask what effect does this, do, does increasing amounts of, of competitor have on enzalutamide's biological activity shown here in blue. And the activity in this case, we're looking at the ability to in, induce cell death. At low levels of competitor, you have high occupancy and you have maximum um, cell death capabilities. But as you increase the levels of testosterone, that occupancy decreases and you see a corresponding drop in the biological activity of insulinamide. Um, however, uh, when you now look at the PROTAC, over the same range, you have maximum retention of biological activity, even though 
we know from loss of enzalutamide that there is competition at the active site and therefore uh, the PROTAC is working uh, at a uh, limited um, target engagement. In fact, what you see here in, in blue, shaded here in blue, are the levels of testosterone that have been reported in the clinic from tumors uh, that are, re are resistant to, to uh, insulutamide. And so these are physiological levels of testosterone and it's uh, reassuring to see that, that the PROTAC is working despite the fact that you have a competitor being generated. And this last one really gets to this original question challenge of just how do you expand the drug target space? I will say up front, this isn't a great example. This is a recent paper from my lab. It's not a great example because there are now inhibitors of KRAS or certain sub, sub uh, types of, of, of KRAS mutations. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it is uh, it's a nice illustration of what's possible. And so as we all know, KRAS is an extremely attractive drug target given its role in uh, tumor genesis and the need for very tight regulation. Uh, moreover, there are point mutations uh, that generate uh, a nucleophilic side chain. This uh, glycine at codon 12 uh, is often mutated to a cysteine residue. And this generates an opportunity, right? So if you have this nucleophilic side chain, is it possible to now come up with a electrophilic covalent uh, inhibitor? And I should say that this was work that was pioneered in some really elegant studies uh, in the laboratory of Kayvon Shokat uh, and, and furthered in a number of companies. I'm showing uh, Marathi's compound here uh, that binds uh, covalently to G12C. And it inhibits downstream signaling, the MAP kinase uh, pathway, uh, as you can see here in the first uh, six hours, uh, as one would anticipate, given the fact that this uh, mutation leads to oncogenic uh, signaling downstream. The problem arises when you go out one, two, three days. Um, not only do you have some upregulation of KRAS, reminiscent uh, of BRD4, but you also have some uh, adaptive resistance where the PERC, uh, phosphate ERK levels start to, to increase as well. Uh, this is true for the, the entire class. Here's another molecule that binds to, to the same site. It has inhibitory activity against phosphate ERK uh, at the early stages uh, in a time course. But as you go out uh, one, two, three days, those uh, phosphate ERK levels uh, start to increase again. And so the, the question is, could there be ways to possibly uh, address this? Um, we have taken the Marathi compound, and since we know where uh, we might be able to add a linker, uh, this solvent exposed point, we've generated a, a VHL-based uh, PROTEC. Uh, and that this VHL-based PROTEC, um, when we add it to cells expressing uh, this mutant, is able to degrade uh, this mutant KRAS, uh, both in H2030 cells, as well as this uh, pancreatic cell line, the Miapaca uh, cell line, uh, with, a, with a wicked hook, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and so that, that was um, nice. It's the first demonstration, as I, uh, I think, uh, of a small molecule uh, degrading uh, uh, endogenous KRAS. Um, and if you look at uh, an extended time course, um, here at six, one day, two days, three days, we can suppress uh, KRAS levels. And if you look here at the Marathi uh, lanes, uh, you can see that the, the, the cells are responding to long-term inhibition of KRAS by actually upregulating uh, KRAS. So, so we're actually able to, again, uh, suppress uh, an increased uh, expression of, of KRAS. This also, I should say, leads to uh, downstream signaling inhibition. Um, looking at 24 hours here, this is the uh, Marathi-based LC2 protact that we developed. We can degrade KRAS and we can suppress uh, ERK signaling. Um, the problem, however, is <clears throat> that we don't see differential biology in the sense that uh, because we are using a covalent uh, inhibitor, uh, the, the biology that we do see 
is uh, the same as the Marathi itself. However, uh, by demonstrating that it is possible to recruit an E3 ligase via protact mechanism, one can envision that if one had a non-covalent uh, ligand to KRAS, one would be able to uh, have a catalytic uh, protact uh, that might have a, a differential biology. And again, this is just uh, the paper that, that came out recently uh, this year, and I encourage people to, to see it if they haven't uh, already. And so where does this leave us? Um, the future, I think, is bright. Um, I, I think that uh, looking for new E3 ligase is, is something that many people are doing, given the fact that we have 600 different E3 ligases, many of them um, uh, are tissue selective or even uh, disease selective. And so I, I think that there's going to be a, a whole new chapter of PROTAC uh, development uh, once these uh, tumor selective and disease selective uh, E3 ligases come online. And of course, on the other end, uh, target proteins, uh, ability to just find a ligand to some nook or cranny uh, on a scaffolding protein, uh, the regulatory protein, um, I think is going to be quite exciting. And, and there's a lot of work uh, being done in that area as well. But I, I will also think that there's still a lot of uh, creativity in the field. Um, within protax and outside of protax uh, like litax uh, but within the field uh, my lab and others have, have reported recently photo uh, protax the conditional protac uh, mediated degradation uh, directed by light um, i am just published excuse me i just uh, uploaded uh, to a bioarchive a paper about traftax a small molecule approach to degrade transcription factors using double stranded uh, DNA as a recruiting element. And, and so uh, I think that that might have a, a really wonderful um, tool approach and potential therapeutic approach for uh, targeting a whole new class transcription factors that currently are under drugged. And so with that, I, I'd just like to uh, uh, finish by uh, acknowledging uh, my lab. This is not uh, everyone that's ever participated in, on this project. The, the list would be too long. This is actually my current lab. Um, this is a, 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 a photo pre-COVID, uh, and this is the lab uh, Christmas uh, uh, gift exchange. Um, but it really has been a, a wonderful journey, uh, really guided by talented chemists and biologists that have made this uh, concept in, into a reality. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge some uh, wonderful collaborators, uh, GSK early on, and most importantly, our Venice. Uh, like I said, they've been able to take this to a whole nother level uh, in the clinic, uh, and, and at least with their androgen receptor, uh, they've seen uh, decreases in PSA levels, demonstrating that the technology works uh, in, in humans as a, as a new therapeutic modality. Uh, so with that, I, I, I'll stop, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.